So we are about to begin chapter number 61 in part one of the Mor Nebuchim of the Guide for the Perplexed. That is page 147 in the Pines translation. Um, and Ramam is going to start a few chapters now discussing God's names as they appear throughout the Bible and throughout other places and what the names mean. Um, it'll be obvious as we read it why this is very uh, relevant to the subject he just discussed, which was uh, giving God attributes um, and that we can't positively describe him in any way. And the only way to come close to the knowledge of God is through negative attributes. That's Rambam's theory, what, one of the theories he's famous for. So by describing what he's not. So after that, now, so then what are the names? What, what do these names mean? So let's start reading. Uh, it'll be very obvious uh, why this is very important and why this is very closely related to the topic you just discussed. All of the names of God, may he be exalted, that are to be found in any of the books. This is obviously referring to the books of, of the Torah. Are derived from actions. In other words, they all describe qualities. They describe things that, that we perceive that are actions of God. The way he manifests in the world that, that, that we see in front of us. There's nothing secret in the matter. This is obvious. And if it's not obvious, Raman will shortly describe to you some examples. And you'll see exactly what he means. The only one exception is the one name, namely the name that is made up of the letters, the, a yud and then a hey, then a vav, then a hey. The four letter name uh, known otherwise as the tetragrammation or something like that. And uh, that, that would be the name uh, which we don't read, we don't pronounce. And Ramam is gonna describe a little bit about what the significance of that, why we don't pronounce it, why we don't speak it, or at least uh, Jews don't, right? So this is the name of God may be exalted that has been originated without any derivation. And I like to hear the, in the Hebrew translation that I have, it reads, right? In other words, it's the name that is specific to God and means nothing else. Like all, a lot of, all the other terms that we had, remember all the examples Ramam gave of terms that, that could mean this, but they also mean that, and they also mean that, and so on, because this uh, sounds like that. And it's, uh, he had all those examples. But the name Yud K Vav K, those the name that made up of those four letters mean nothing else to us. All they mean is God. It's, there's no other meaning to that word. Um, so, and for this reason, it is called the articulated name, or I meaning the Shem Meforash, right? The the name that is specific, the name that is specific to God, because it doesn't have any other meaning. And this is important. Why? Because this means that this name gives a clear, unequivocal indication of his essence. This is describing God himself may be exalted. And therefore, the name has no meaning because we don't understand God's essence, which is what we just said. So in other words, that name of God, according to Rambam, represents exactly what he just described us, that God has an essence which has no meaning that a human being can, that, that has meaning to us as humans. On the other hand, all of the other great names given give their indication in an equivocal way. They, they indicate, uh, you know, something, a quality, right, which is equivocal, meaning they have other meanings as well. Um, so uh, um, being derived from terms signifying actions, right? They, they come from terms that describe an action of God, you know, something that happens in this world that we perceive, which is an action of God, the like of which, as we have made clear, exists as our own actions. Right? They can also be referring in some cases to things that a human being does, right? that we do as, as, as people. Even the name that is uttered instead of the yud and then the hey and above and then a hey, even the name that when we see that word in writing, we read it Adonai, right? Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud is how it's read traditionally, right? which literally means our master or the master or my master. right? So that word itself that we use when we see the letters yud, K, Bob, K, right, is derived from a term signifying lordship. It's something that we know about, right? We're familiar with what a master is. That's something that a human being can perceive, can describe, can experience. So, for example, uh, we say the Lord of the land spoke, right? Uh, it was referring to, uh, you know, the Adonai Haaretz, right? 
So it's even refers sometimes in the Torah or, or in general Hebrew speech, an Adon refers to a master. It refers to something that we experience in, our, in the very human realm. And when we describe God that way, that's why that name of God is also, it, that's an example. It's a name which refers to something that you and I know of, a master. And then we experience God's action in this world as if he was a master. So we describe him that way, right? Um, the difference between saying Adoni, right? And you're saying Adonai, it's important, uh, you know, is, is the, with a different vocalization of the letter Nun, right? Is analogous to the difference between saying Sari, right? Which Sari would mean in Hebrew, my a chief or my sar, a sar is like a chief or an officer, right? And you're saying Sarai, which is our, uh, like the wife of Abraham, right? Where Sarai would mean, it's, it's uh, and, 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 and one of the commentaries I saw, this explain, you know, Sarai means that when you're referring to our chief, but in reference to her, her uh, relationship to others besides just her, besides just you, besides just the individual talking. So that's why when we say, you can say Adoni, I can talk to, I can talk about, you know, my master. If I'm a servant, I have a master. I don't, he's my master, Adoni. If I say Adonai, that's referring to the master of all, which is God. For these words, right, if you have the, the, the I sound are emphatic and have a general character applicable also to other beings. Uh, thus, it has been said to an angel, Ad, Adonai, uh, you know, um, it says, uh, pass not away, I pray thee, do not leave me, right? So that's just, it was examples. Now, so I'm explaining this to you, Ramam says, especially with regard to the word Adonai, which we speak instead of the four letter name, right? Because it is the most particularized, right? It's the, it's the, like the highest of all of the names that are commonly known. Uh, the names of God may be exalted. For in the case of all the others, it's even more obvious than that, such as, God, the judge, God, the just, the gracious, the merciful, and Elohim. These are all names of God, which we know obviously means something else too, right? God is a judge. This is human judges. God is just, you know, a person can be just. A person could not be just. God, uh, God is gracious. Well, a person could be gracious. A person could be merciful. And Elohim, we know also often, and Ramam discussed this at length in the chapter we studied before, the word Elohim also means uh, a judge, a, a, a court, right? Uh, so, so these are all things that we apply to God because of the actions that we experience. It is manifest that they are used in a general way, as well as that they are derived. Clearly, the derived meaning that, that there are words that mean something else, right? That mean uh, 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 something that we can experience as humans. And then we describe God that way. And Ramam already explained what it means. It's not, we're not really describing him. We're just describing the actions that we experience. Um, as for the name that, if pronounced, is composed of those four letters, the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He, right? No commonly accepted derivation of it is known, and none other than he has a part in it. There is no other word that means those four letters. It doesn't mean anything else. It only means God. There can be no doubt about the fact that this great name, which, as you know, is not pronounced, except with the only time the name is ever pronounced, is in the temple itself, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, by the sanctified priests of the Lord, by the actual priests, right? And only when they say the, 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 the benedictions, the blessings of the priests, you know, uh, may, may God bless you and keep you, and so on. And by the high priest upon the day, on Yom Kippur itself, right? And upon the day of fasting is Yom Kippur, right? So that name is indicative of a notion with reference to which there is no association between God may be exalted and what is other than he. That, that name is referring to the, the, this idea that I have just described to you in the previous chapters that, that, that God is an entity that with which we cannot compare at all any human experience to God. Perhaps it indicates the notion of a necessary existence. Perhaps, and here Ramam is hinting to the fact that within those words are the letters He and Vav often mean Hove, meaning is, right? Something is. Right. So all, in other words, it doesn't really mean anything. It just means that whatever it is, it is right. God is right. What that is, who he is, how he is, that will never get. But he is. And that could be the Saram is suggesting that might be the Shoresh of the root of the word 
uh, that that was spelled out by those four letters, according to the Hebrew language, of which we today know only a very scant portion. Rambam is hinting to the fact that much of uh, of uh, of old Hebrew may have been lost over the years, so we ne don't necessarily know what that meant. And also with regard to its pronunciation, right? Generally speaking, so we don't really even know how to pronounce it properly. Ram is going to say in a little bit why we don't know how to pronounce it properly, but. Because if you look at it and try to pronounce it based on the normal Hebrew vocalization, you hit up against certain grammatical difficulties, which, which we don't really know how to answer. So generally, and we'll describe what those, some of those are in a minute. Generally speaking, the greatness of this name and the prohibition against pronouncing it. Why is there a prohibition? It is due to its being indicative of the essence of him. So Ramam always, he always, he doesn't say that you're not allowed to say something, you're not allowed to do something, or you have to say something, you have to do something just because. There has to be a logical reason for it. And here he's saying, why don't we pronounce God's name? Because by not, by having a prohibition against pronouncing God's name, we're teaching us ourselves something. We're teaching ourselves the idea that we can't describe God. This is a, a really a profound idea because all of it, Ramam is taking a prohibition, which we don't necessarily understand. Like what would, what would be the big deal? It, it, and, I, and all is said and done, it's just a word. But the point is, is that, is that, is that by saying we can't say that word, what we're doing is we are, we are reminding ourselves of the fact, well, why can't we say that word? Because that word indicates something that we cannot describe. So don't try to describe it. By trying to describe it and using the word that describes it, you're, you're pretending that you can describe it and you can't. So therefore, we're, we don't say it in such a way that none of the created things is associated with him in this indication, right? Because that describes, indicates this very idea, right? That, um, that no created thing, no human animal or any other created uh, thing can possibly comprehend or come close to. As the sages, may the memory be blessed, have said, my name that is peculiar to me. That's, that's a, a quote from the Talmud, from the Gemara in Sota. Now, so what about all the other ones? As for the other names, all of them, because of their being derived, they indicate attributes. That is not an essence alone, but an essence possessing attributes. All of those other names, they're problematic in a sense because they're describing, you know, descriptions, attributes of God. And um, for this reason, they produce in one's fantasy the conception of multiplicity. They could give you the idea that there's a lot of qualities that God has. Because he just said before, God was just, he was uh, gracious, merciful, uh, uh, and all, all of those, all of those, he was a judge, all of those ideas. So you think, oh, God is like this, and he has like this, and he has like this, and he's like this. All of a sudden, you're making multiplicities, and we already discussed that at night. For this reason, I mean to say that they produce in one's fantasy the thought that the attributes exist. They might make you imagine that they exist, and that there is an essence and a notion super added to this essence. So there's God that exists. And then there's a lot of notions. He, he could be this way, he could be that way, he could be the other way, etc. For the indications of all derivative terms are such that they indicate a notion and a substratum that is not clearly stated and with which the notion in question is connected. Okay. In other words, when you use a derivative term, something that compares, right, you're suggesting that, that there is, there, in part of the essence is merciful, and part of the essence is this, and part of the essence is that. However, it has been demonstrated, we have already bang this into our heads a million times, that God may be exalted is not a substratum, is not like a, is not a material, uh, right, with which some notions are connected, right? It is known that the derived names are to be understood in two ways. And remember, he told us this several times, either, right, um, with reference to a relation of a certain action or with reference to directing the mind towards his perfection, right? We, say, we stated this before many times that the attributes the truth, according to Ramam, is simple. the only reason why they're used is either because they're describing actions that we perceive and we experience, or they're trying to help us get closer to God. They're trying to help us. They tell us he's powerful, so we should start thinking in a, in a high, lofty, powerful direction to get us closer. But really, we need to know that he's not. Is, is someone raising their hand? Uh, yeah. I, okay, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was... Um, on the exception that we went over earlier very quickly, when it says, except in the sanctuary uh, during presumably Yom Kippur, uh, uh -huh. I had read somewhere that, you know, 
that of course is true and it's like 44 syllables or something nobody really knows i guess oh okay but, but, so what about the exception because then he goes on to seem to ignore the exception so the, the the 40 the, the the names of 12 letters the names of 42 letters those things that the Talmud, the gemara talks about um he's gonna get to give him give him oh. a chance okay, okay. Well, hold on yeah, give him off. a chance um but but that's a you know you're bringing up something important but 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 we're gonna get there okay oh. um so um, I'm going to try my camera one more time. Maybe, who knows? Maybe we'll get lucky. Uh, um, so for this reason, Rabbi Hanina, remember he mentioned Rabbi Hanina before, he would have shrunk. In other words, he was upset with uh, the dictum of scripture that, right? Akel agadol hagibar vihanora, right? Those words that, uh, you know, that we do say in the Siddur, right? Remember, Ramam explained two chapters ago that the only reason why they say it were not for the two necessary obligations mentioned by him. And for those who don't remember, the two necessary ones was A, that those were terms used by the prophets themselves, and B, that the prophets themselves, as the men of the great assembly, those were the final group of prophets, the men of the great assembly, which in our tradition includes Ezra, uh, um, and you know the Ezra the so Ezra the scribe from the famous book of Ezra plus those that accompanied him right and we have by tradition that Mordechai of Purim so I'll bring a little bit of the upcoming holiday Purim and uh, was also on that on that uh, on that group those were prophets who who said these words we will put in the prayer book right and the reason ostensibly is because we uh, uh, that they're describing, but but any more than that, that we bring up from our own hearts or that you want to put in your own text, the Ramam says you wouldn't be able to do it. He would have done so because these names, in other words, Rabbi Hanina himself didn't even want to use those terms. He ended up saying, okay, because of the reasons which we just stated. But he, he, he had a problem with those because it also produced in one's fantasy the thought of essential attributes. I mean, the thought that these names refer to perfections existing in him. And when the names deriving from the actions pertaining to him may be exalted, were multiplied. And then as the guy went on and on and on, adding more and more and more qualities, they produced in the fantasy of some men the thought that he has many attributes, just as there is a multiplicity of actions from which these names derive, right? In the same way that, um, that you know, uh, uh, all, of those, all of those qualities, all of those attributes describe things that you and I experience as different things. Hence, and this is really deep here, Scripture promises, and this is the book of Zechariah, right? It says the famous word, you know, we have this all the way at the end of the, of the davening of every tefillah and the end of Aleinu, Hashem echad echad. on that day, that ultimate day of redemption, Hashem, the, the four-letter name, Yud, the name of Yud Kevav Ke, right? Echad will be one, Ushimo Echad, and his name will be one, which means that in the same way that he is one, in fact, right? He will be invoked at that time by one name only. There will only be one name because we will all understand, right? Which is that one name of which is indicative only of the essence and was not derivative. We will have divested ourselves of all these anthropomorphic notions of God and the entire world will recognize that God is one, right? Meaning that, he, and, 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 and Shemo Echad, the name is one, the specific name that with those four letters, you know, when you think of, when all of a sudden this this the idea of God's name, we can understand why it's so important. Why why does Zechariah choose to say in the future God's name will be one? What what does that mean? Well, Ramam tells us that it means that we will finally understand this concept and this notion that, according to Ramam, is so important. This basic idea that God is one that takes us away from the ideas of polytheism. In the chapters of of Pirkei de Rabbi Lezer, of chapters of Rabbi Lezer, and another collection of uh, sayings from the Tanoim, from the from the early rabbis, they have said before the world was created, there was only God and His name, right? The Holy One, blessed be He, and His name. What does that mean? Is it, was there two things? No, right? Consider how now how this dictum states clearly that all the derivative names have come into being only after the world has come into being. Only after creation could there be, right? Descriptors of God, right? Only after God creates the world can there suddenly be, um. Um, uh, 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 you know, we can call him as a judge. We can call him as just. We can call him as all these things. Before creation, all that stuff was irrelevant because all there was was the essence of God himself, right? And all those names mean nothing. They describe actions. Actions are completely irrelevant prior to creation. This is correct. For all these names have been laid down so as to correspond to the actions existing in the world. That's what those names meant. 
However, if you envisage his essence as it is when divested and stripped of all actions, then he no longer has a derived name in any respect, whatever. The only name he has is the original name, which is discussing his essence. In fact, we have no non-derivative name except the one in question. The only name that with which God is described that has no other meaning is the name which is spelled with a yud and then a hey and then a vav and a hey, which is the articulated name simply, which is the tema before us. And now Ramam is going to go off attacking people that that are right kameot, right? Uh, kameot are charms, mystical charms that you would wear or, or hang in your house or something that would protect you. And they'd write in it names of God or what they called names of God. So the Ramam is, is going to mince no words, knocking this entire practice. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I understand that there are pockets of Judaism that use this stuff and do these things. And I'm not here to knock people. I'm here to teach what Ramam said. So let's see what he said. And you can like it. You can leave it. You can not like it. But this is what he says. OK, <laughs> so um, do not similar to what he said before about certain poems during the during the prayers. Do not think anything other than this and do not let occur to your mind the vain imaginings of the writers of charms. In the Hebrew, it's translated as cameo right? Or what names you may hear from them, or when they repeat names of God, or may find in their stupid books. And actually, the Hebrew translates it a little stronger than stupid. The English was, was uh, taking it down a notch, and the Arabic, according to Kapach, was even stronger than that. Names that they have invented, which are not indicative of any notion whatsoever, but which they call the names, uh, uh, but which they call the names, and of which they think they necessitate holiness and purity and work miracles. All these are stories that it is not seemly for a perfect man to listen to, much less to believe. None is called the articulated name. There are no names that are Shema Mephorosh except for the name which we just mentioned, having four letters that is written but not read in accordance with the sounds written down, right? We don't read it the way it's, vocal, the way it's written as, as we just stated. For the sages have stated clearly in Sifri, thus shall ye bless the children of Israel. Thus, that is in these words, thus, that is using the articulated name, that's it. That's the only one that refers to God. None of these other names that they're making up have any meaning whatsoever. It is all said there in the, in the, in the temple, the name is pronounced that it is written, whereas in the rest of the country, the name used to replace it is pronounced instead. When the name used to replace it, we already said is what we say, Dalad Nun Yud, okay? Um, and in the Talmud, it said, thus means with the, when it says, this is how it's said, right? It means with the Shem HaMaforosh, the articulated name. If you ask, with the articulate name or with the name used to replace it, this may be learned from the words and they should put my name, that is my name that is peculiar to me. That's the, she's talking about the Gemara and Sota that we referred to before that says that only in the temple do you use that name. Thus it has become clear to you that the Shema Meforash is nothing, none of these other things that these people are making up in their nonsensical magical charms, right? But rather it is the name having four letters and that's it. It alone is indicative of the essence without associating any notion with it. There's nothing else, okay? For this reason, so because this is the, um, uh, now, so for this reason, the sages have said of it that it is the name that is peculiar to me, right? It is the name, right, uh, that is only, it, that all, it's the only name that specifies God. That's the name that's spelled out with those letters. For this reason, the sage, I'm sorry, now I shall make clear to you what has incited men to the beliefs with regard to the names. Ne in the next chapter, I'm going to tell you clearly, and I just turned the page, I'm on 150 now. I'm going to make clear to you why, um, <laughs> why people got into this nonsense of God's names, right? Where does it come from? Where does all this stuff come from? And I'm going to trace it for you in the next chapter. I will strip it of its covering so nothing doubtful remains. I'll make sure you know this clearly, unless you wish to lead yourself astray, right? There's supposed to be a comma there. When you read in the Hebrew translation, uh, there's a comma, right? With reference to a chapter. In other words, in the next chapter, I'm going to describe it to you. So, um, so let me just reiterate. So we just finished chapter 61, and Ramam said a lot of very important thoughts, right? But the first one is that the name of Yud Ke Vav Ke, right? refers to God's essence and has no other derivative meaning. It doesn't refer to anything else. So we don't have any way possibly of understanding what it means. That's number one. Number two, um, all of the other names refer to attributes, right? All of them, and not to God himself. Even the name that we pronounce when we see the letters, Yud and He and so on in the, in the, in the Torah written, the, what, what we pronounce when we say Aleph Dalet, right? 
also refers to an attribute. It refers to God as a master, right? So, um, so and, and he explained the meaning of what Zechariah meant when he said, that on that day in the future, that one day in the future, God's name will be one and he will be one because the only name with which we will need to refer to him is that one because we, the entire world will then understand that God has no attributes and cannot be described that way in any way that a human being can possibly comprehend. If there's anyone that wants to come, and then he, he went on a very strong, very strong criticism of magical charms and supposed Kabbalistic names of God, which is a very clear, very clear uh, opinion of the Ramam. And I'm obviously, I, like I said, I'm aware that there are other streams of Judaism that disagree with this, but the Ramam was extremely strong about it. And the language that he used was very strong that that you did not to use these kinds of charms and never ever to imagine that there's any such thing as another form of God's name that has any sort of magical power. So I'm going to stop for a moment. I'll let open for questions before we go on to the next chapter where he's going to address what Jeffrey was partly what you were referring to before, which was the why the Gemara talks about the name of 12 letters, the name of 42 letters. He's going to strip it of all of its mystical meanings and suddenly it's going to it's going to sound very different. I'm sorry I had to turn my video off because it started acting up again. But if anyone has any comments, please do so. Questions, comments? Or is this like we're so high in the heavens now that we're all just like floating now? <laughs> no. I'm anxious to get to 60 next chapter before. Oh, oh, okay. Some... All right. Well, we'll get there then. Um, the, um, so let's do chapter 62. Okay. Um, the uh, the um, we have received the commandment with regard to the benediction of pre. I'm sorry, I keep trying and it keeps messing up. <laughs> uh, the, the, with uh, we know right, uh, we have received, with regard to the benediction of priests, right? That that when the priests stand up in the Beit Hamikdash in the temple when and they give the blessing, right? And they say, uh, and we know that it has to be with, done with God's name in which the name of the Lord it figures as it is written. In the temple, God's name was read as it is written. That was the only time that this was ever done. And this name is the articulated name, which we just referred to. Now, not everybody knew how this name was to be pronounced. I told you I was gonna, he was going to say this, so now he's explaining this. And how every one of its letters should be vocalized. And which of its letters, if any, should be redoubled, which means have a dagesh. <laughs> so we don't really know anymore. Does anyone here... Uh, a Hebraist who knows how to pronounce a hay with a duggish in it, with a dot in it, as opposed to a hay without a duggish in it. You mean Anyone a mapike? Or a mapike, right. Yeah, I mean, so I, I read the Torah every Shabbos, so I have to. Yeah, but do we, what Ramam is saying here is that we, we have, people have different ways of doing things, but we don't really know the difference, Right. Right. So, 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 um, we, we, we have our various traditions of doing things, but we know within, within the, the people nowadays that speak Hebrew, there's like 7,000 different ways to, to pronounce things. And if you ask 7,000 people, you get 7,000 opinions as to which is the right one. Right. So, um, so maybe and, that's why the priests had to train for five years before they could, um, cause they, you know, they knew the right way. Right. <laughs> uh, maybe, but, um, well, he's going to talk a little bit about what you just mentioned about alert, how why it's it taking so long to teach people the name. Ramam is going to tell us why, but we'll see that in a second. Accordingly, the men of knowledge have transmitted this. I mean, the mode of pronouncing it. That because we don't, not everybody knows, and because it's actually complex how to pronounce these things, um, uh, they 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 would transmit it to each other, but they did not teach it to anyone except once a week to a worthy scholar. I believe that that's also a quote from the Gemara, from the Talmud. The dictum where also the Talmud says, the sages transmit the name having four letters once a week to their sons and their pupils, referring not only to their teaching, the mode of pronouncing the name. So, so Rama is saying that number one, how to pronounce the name specifically, how to do it is something that, that only some people know and was taught. But more than that, the, to making known the notion, the idea, the concept, that God's existence or, or that, that the essence of God is something that we cannot describe. That concept is something that's difficult for the masses to get to wrap their heads around. Okay, so therefore, it's something that should only be explained and taught to people that can get it. 
because of which this name has been originated without any derivation. Accordingly, there also would be in this notion a divine secret, right? A divine secret, which not everyone understands. And remember, as we went through this book, we've seen Rambam say on many cases, that unfortunately, the masses cannot always understand these ideas. And when you try to teach it, they can get the wrong idea. Furthermore, we also know that there was a name having 12 letters, which that name was in sanctity inferior to the name having four letters. We know that the rabbis of the Talmud discuss a name with 12 letters, right? In my opinion, Ramam says, right? Now, remember, he's not saying that I know the name of 12 letters. He's just saying, I'm going to tell you, right, what I think that it was about. So the most probable supposition is that the name that had 12 letters was not one name, but two or three, the sum of the letters of which came to 12, meaning it was a phrase, it was a concept, it was an idea that was composed of words that expressed an idea. And that idea, we'll see in a second, is a description of God's essence. How do you describe God's essence? Ramam, and I'm going to say this as commentary of my own, Ramam would obviously, after reading his previous chapters, tell us that it was using his principle of negative attributions. There's no way the Ramam could possibly accept the description of actual God's essence that are in human created words. The name was uttered in all the cases in which the name having four letters occurred in the reading of scripture that they used in those old days instead of what we use nowadays of, of Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. In those days, the Rambam understands that the name of 12 letters was a phrase that people read when they saw the word Yud Kev of K, they used the 12 letter name. So they used a phrase, right? Which described God, okay? But it wasn't the Yud Kev of K. So it was very similar to what we do today, right? But it was just a different name. This is the Rambam's explanation. Uh, there's uh, many other explanations of what the name of 12 letters is because it's this mysterious thing that every people, you know, kind of like to talk about. But this is Rama. This is how he explains it. This is how he understood it. Just as we utter today in the same case as Aleph Dalet. Do you hear that? So uh, that's what I was describing outside. Now, this name also, namely the one having 12 letters, is undic undoubtedly indicative of a notion more particularly pertaining to God, right, than is the case with regard to what is indicated by Aleph Dalet. In other words, it was a loftier term. It was a higher term. It was closer to a description than the one that we use, which is Aleph Dalet. But this name was not prohibited and withheld from any of the men of knowledge. On the contrary, everybody who sought to learn this name was taught it. If a person came to Shul and wanted to know, what do I say when I see, <clears throat> when I'm reading the Torah and it says Yud Kei Vav Kei, then <clears throat> they would teach them, this is what you say, the 12 letter name. But this was not the case with regard to the name having four letters. How to pronounce that name properly was staved for the temple. Only special people knew that. For no one of those knowing it taught it to anyone except once a week the sons of people like what said before. In consequence, what happened was blameworthy people started learning the name having 12 letters and through this corrupted beliefs. They started having these notions because it was a phrase that was supposedly describing God. They didn't understand the concept that I've been teaching you, Ramam says, that whenever we describe God, we're not really describing him. And they started having mind, ooh, this is the name that describes God. And they started thinking that they knew how to describe the essence of God. Now, that could be a really big mistake, okay? I, I, I'm going to go out on a slight of a limb over here, right? I want you to think, like, why does it matter so much when you describe God, right? What, why is that an important notion? And think about the essence and depth of the religion of Judaism in contrast to the most popular religion in, in, in parts of the world, especially the country we live in today, where descriptions of God are very, very, very um, personal and literally as a person. Ramam is so important to him to emphasize that we can't try to describe God as a being of any sort, let alone, of course, not a human being, right? Because if you give him attributes and you give him properties of a human, you completely corrupt the concept of God. Trying to get that confused and messing it up is a huge, huge problem. And I hope you can understand why this is a big problem. When people argue over, over Judaism versus Christianity and get involved in polemics and things, they think they're arguing a silly argument over who's the real Messiah. But what we're actually discussing is like the most fundamental theological issue that the entire religion of monotheism is based on trying to use descriptors for God or giving people an image to say, this is God, 
is according to my mind, he's like, it's beyond, it's, it's worse than blasphemy. It's, 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 it's unimaginable. I, I say this because it's extremely important. And, if, and, and it's, 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 it's really the underlying essence of what our religion is, right? Trying to, trying to make God into a person is, is so distant from what our religion is based on and so distant from what Rambam is trying to teach us the Torah is about that you can't, you can't possibly claim, someone who wants to claim, and unfortunately I hear this so many times that you can be uh, Jewish and, and believe in any concept that is remotely similar to Christianity is so beyond the realm of possibility. If someone tries to do that, it is absolutely not Judaism. It is completely the, by its very, and if you think I'm passionate about this, you can hear it and it obviously is. And, and, and it's, just, it's just really, it, it, it's so important and it's not hidden. It's, the Ramam is writing this for a reason. He knows who his enemies are. He knows what the other religions going on in the world are. So there's a reason why he says this. Anyway, I'm going to stop for a second because I see some hands up. Go ahead. So how is it that in our prayer book, you know, it, it's our father, our king, our, which, you know, obviously it's for the, the visual that people get this, you know, and it, it, um, this is, this is, it's, it's, that's why Ramam was blasting so much all the additions to the prayer book, right? Right, he said the only thing, even the, even the prayer book itself, right? The first three words of the Shmon Esrei, of the Amidah, HaKel HaGadol HaGibar Vyanora, the Ramam said the, 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 the re gut reaction of the rabbis was to, was to get angry and no, you can't say that, right? That was their gut reaction because, because, um, because how could you describe him? And then the Ramam said, we do because the simple folk need to be led to the to the the, the goal of Zachariah, like Rabbi said uh, that Rabbi said the goal of the Zachariah is that one day we will all get it. Yeah, we have to work on it, we have to achieve it, we have to get there, right? And we're trying these words that are chosen are chosen to help us get there. When we sit in Davin, we're supposed to use these words to guide us in the right direction. Or we can use these words, and if we understand that this is how we experience God in this world, but nothing about what God is Himself. So, where would Rambam be on? And and this just came up with somebody today yeah. that I had to speak to. The idea of a personal God, like God is guiding my life. God is because He's compassionate. He's you know helping me and and personally guiding my life. It's, it's, um, it's, 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 how, it's, what would Rambam say about that? Well, he didn't, that's, that, that's, that's a non-Maimonidean God. I'm going to say in a very simple sense, Rambam did not, it, it, we're, we're going to see that. I mean, he's going to get into that in detail and he has already to large extent in our previous lectures, we've discussed this a bit, but, but, but Rambam does not believe how God intervenes in this world and his hashkacha and how much he pays attention to this world, so to speak, it's all part of what you're asking, right? Is, um, is something that he's going to describe in, in, in very much detail, but he's gonna be driving towards a point where, where the world is a world that God created and set up in such a way and runs in such a way, right? That the world, that, 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 that the consequences of our actions, right, are what we reap. Right, the consequences of our actions as people, the consequences of our actions as humanity in general, together, and so on. So, so, so it is God acting, right? But He acts through nature. He acts through the world we live in, and He acts through the way He made this world, right? And He made this world in such a way that when we're good, things go well, and when we're not, things don't. Now, it's it's obviously, but what about when the person who's good and bad things happen? I promise we'll get there, right? But 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 whether God sits and looks at you and says, you know, what did Saul do today? Does he deserve a raise or not? Right. Right. That is not. Um, it's not how it works. And he and he has said very clearly until now that God doesn't respond to prayers in the sense that, oh, he prayed to me. Now I'm going to give it to him. That's also not how it works. Ramam has said what prayer does. And we've studied this already. And he's going to go into more detail. Prayer changes you. Right. 
if things become better, it's because they changed you. And the natural consequences of you being better is that things are better. Now, are they better because they actually are measurably? Or are they better because you've learned how to deal with them by, by recognizing your own strengths, your own weaknesses, and, and recognizing the meaning of the universe? That's the different story. But now, but but you asked a good question. We're going off a little, but I went off a little, so I'll take the blame for that, right? <laughs> but um, I just wanted to emphasize why these um these names, you know, why why Ramam is 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 it's so important to him when he says that people went to into these corrupted beliefs when they started thinking that God has these attributes when they started describing Him. Why it's so important to him, and that's why I went off on that tangent. Jeff, you have your hand up. I see. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, uh, in terms of humanizing God, right, doesn't that lead then to Jesus, the Son of yes. God, and then this Holy Trinity? So suddenly, once you go down that route, you're into a polythe polytheism. Is that something that's discussed as the linkage well, between? Ramam said Trinity? he said it blatantly. He said two chapters ago that this describing God with attributes will lead to polytheism. Okay. okay. Right. And and and, and 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 Ramam and also directly said that about the Trinity, right? Because okay. that is polytheism, and 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 the Ramam is is the main authority that people quote when they when they claim that that Christianity is 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 idolatry. Now, um, I know that that would get a lot of people angry, and most Jewish authorities don't believe Christianity is authority uh, is idolatry. The problem the problem with that is that. If you, the people that quote it, and this is the irony of it all, the people that quote Rambam and say, oh, you Christians are idolaters, right? Those people are, according to the Rambam, virtually always idolaters themselves, right? <laughs> <laughs> because um, because because if you take the Rambam's philosophy to its extreme, you know, well, or if you take it straight straight up, a lot of the things that people do with, you know, Kameas, with magical charms, which we just learned. Or people that describe God in all these descriptive ways. According to Ramam, that's also idolatry, right? So if you're going to start criticizing other people and their beliefs, well, you got to look at your own first, right? So, um, so, so you, yeah. Will you address also how Ramam, you know, the whole the talk about the Shekhinah and, you know. The... Yeah, well, I mean, Ramam did did discuss that, uh, you know, and, and the Shekhinah would then be uh, uh, an experience that we have of closeness to God. Now, so, so I, I want to be clear. I want to be clear about something, about my own personal opinion. Do I think that most Christians are polytheists? Absolutely not. And I'll tell you why, right? Because most Christians realize that, there's, that they're monotheists and they understand, right? That now they have, might have all kinds of confusing explanations, which would, it might work for them. It might not work for them. I really couldn't care. I'm not a Christian, right? But, but most Christians are not polytheists. They're monotheists. They, but, but, but I know for sure that when you try to describe God as a human being, it can be it, as confusing as it is to think about God as a powerful old man in the sky that can split seas. It's a way 10 billion times more confusing if you describe him as a guy that walks around the street and does miracles, right? If you really want to confuse the hell out of people, so, excuse my language, like then, then like actually describe God as a person. Like grandma would go, did go bonkers from that kind of description. Like it's bad enough. He had to explain why the Torah says God has a, a stretched his outstretched arm, right? That's bad enough. Now you're going to tell me that you're actually going to say that God became a human. That's like, that, that's like, you know, so, so most, you know, most Jewish authorities don't believe that Christians are idolaters. They just believe that they're really, 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 really confused, Right. But the Rambam is now explaining to us, but why is this important? And this is why it's important, because it can lead you to thinking of an ultimate. When you, the more you describe God as a human being, the more you bring him down to earth in this, in this respect, the, you're, you're, you're making him human and human and human. And all of a sudden, you, you, start, you start relating to him like a human being. You start thinking that he should relate to you like a human being. And in Rambam's mind, that's the biggest mistake you could possibly make. Okay, so we just learned how he describes the 12 letters and why once we started describing God with words and names and letters, people went off the wrong track. So this happens whenever anyone who is not a perfect man, in other words, anyone who hasn't been learning more Nebuchadnezzar until now, I'm at the bottom of page 150 now, comes to know that something is not as he imagined it to be in the first place, right? 
right? So, another, so, so, so someone started describing God to him. The sages therefore made a secret of this name likewise. So they said, you know what? Let's stop describing him with this stuff, right? So, um, and taught it only to the discreet. So that name, which used to be how everyone in Shul said it, like we say, everyone used to use the 12 letter name, but they said, no, let's get this out of here. It's confusing people, right? To trying to protect people from making this terrible theological mistake that you can describe God like a human, right? So then he says, um, so um, and they only used it giving their benediction in the sanctuary because by this time they seized saying God's name even in the Beit HaMikdash, even in the temple, they had stopped using that and they started using the 12 letter name. Rama was giving us the history of this. And it's interesting because from his perspective, this history is the history of trying to get away from thinking of God in a, in, with human terms, thinking of him as, as with human qualities, right? As they ceased to mention, okay. So they say, and he brings a story that after the death of Shimon HaTzadik, so we're looking, Shimon HaTzadik was somewhere around uh, what we would call the year uh, negative uh, work. negative 60 or 70 or so in the, uh, in the way um, uh, uh, somewhere around there. So about uh, 150 years before the second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. His brethren, the priests, stopped using the name and giving their benediction. In other words, they stopped using the name spelled with the Yud and the hey, right? So, um, <clears throat> so instead, they used the name with 12 letters. So at first, they also say at first, the name with 12 letters was transmitted to everyone. And then when libertines, people that were free and did what they wanted and weren't careful, it was transmitted only to the discreet. And then only the, the, the priests said it, right? So, and they said it in a way that people shouldn't hear it. And Rabbi Tarfon mentioned that one time, because Rabbi Tarfon was one of the great rabbis of the Mishnah, he was alive in the time in the latter years of the temple of the Beit HaMikdash. So he was a Kohen. And when he ascended the dais, when he, um, after the father of my mother, after when he descended, who was also a Kohen, and he was listening to the priest, he heard the name and met the 12 letter name being mumbled under the breath, right? So uh, and being mumbled in such a way that everyone else shouldn't hear it. Why he was able to hear it, maybe he had better hearing, maybe he was carefully listening, Maybe he was just a uniquely sharp mind, but either way, that was that. So now Ramam continues going on in history. They also had a name having 42 letters. It is known to anyone capable of mental representation, and Ramam is very strong language and is, is, is evident here. Anyone that can, with a brain, realizes that it's not possible that 42 letters should form one word. Now, I remind you that in other traditions, they do think that it's a 42 letter name that actually had, right? Um, I'm going to see if my video works now. Um, so there was actually several words. Well, why is this important to Rambam? Who cares if it's one word or 10 words? It's important to Rambam because, again, mm. it's a description. It's a phrase. It's a sentence that describes something. And that's important because Rambam is going to tell us again, something goes wrong when you try to describe God, right? When you try to pretend that you know how to describe, him, right? You start getting led down the wrong path which is going to be, I'm giving, I'm going, jumping ahead a little, which is why they got rid of teaching people the 42 letter name. Um, uh, Jack, do you want to say something? Is it, is, would you have to unmute yourself? What would the Rambam say about Ashkocha Protis? So you guys are asking really big questions and Rambam will deal with that at length. So she just mentioned that too. Uh, uh, um, Leslie did. Um, so, so he's going to describe Ashkocha Pratis. And Ramam had an idea. Ashkocha Pratis is, is, is um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you translate that into English? Um, um, uh, Indivi individual. Uh, like individual, like, like God having, uh, you know, caring and watching over, right, what each person does in an, on an individual level. Right. So Ramam held, and he's going to describe this in detail, that Ashkocha Pratis was, it goes in grades. The higher you are and the closer you are to God, the more God watches over you and what you do, right? How that works and how he intellectually and philosophically describes that, I, I promise if, it believe, I shouldn't promise because, you know, God should give us long life, we'll get there, right? But he's going to devote a lot of time and effort to that. So I, we will get there. I'm not brushing you off, I promise. <laughs> but but I, I just can't do that now It's because he's going off on a different thing now. It's good because you keep throwing these things out there. It'll whet everybody's curiosity and, and we'll get to it. <laughs> so, um, so there are certainly several words, the number of letters which amounted to 42. 
There is no doubt that these words were necessarily indicative of several notions. And these notions came near to a representation of the essence of him. They were a description of the essence of God, right? Which remember, according to Rambam, the way you describe God is through negative attributes, right? May be exalted in the way that we have stated, right? Rambam always reminds us, don't think that there's ever words that are human creations that can describe God's essence. These words had numerous letters. They were called a name, right? In, the, in our mind, we think a name, you know, Jack or Saul or whoever, you know, right? But, but this, why do we call a sentence a name? So he says, um, uh, because they were indicative of a notion. They described a thing. So therefore, they were called a name, even though it wasn't really a name. Like all the other names originated without any derivation like any other name, in other words, which isn't being said because there's something like this and, and compared. Derivation is a comparison, like we discussed many times. And these words were numerous only with a view to making the notion in question as to the reason why it was made up of several words is because it was necessary to have several words to describe whatever notion it was that was being described. For sometimes many words are used in order to make a single notion understood. That makes sense. Understand this accordingly and know that that which was taught were the notions indicated by these names. When they say that they were teaching these names, it doesn't, of course, it means they taught the names. But much more important than that is that they were describing what's the point? Like, what does these names mean? Like, what are they describing? Okay. The term articulated name, however, nowhere is the shame Hamaforash referring. And this is a mistake. Ramam is saying this because others make this mistake. They think. That when you say Shem HaMaforash, it refers to, there's several names that can be called the Shem HaMaforash. One being the four-letter name yud K vav K, and the other being the 12-letter name, which none of us know, right? The other one being the 42-letter name, which none of us know. The Ram says, no, Shem HaMaforash is specifically yud K vav K, because why? Because yud K vav K describes God's essence, right? Remember, Ramam said that. The other names, the 12 and the 42 letters name, describe attributes of God. Right, and there's a big difference there. So, um, so remember, and Yudke Vavke describes God's essence because it means that we don't understand God's essence. It means He is. That's it. It is. We don't know what He is. We can't describe it. We can't describe Him in any way, shape, or form. Literally, shape or form. Right. But God just is. He's an essence that exists. And even the word "exists" isn't even a good description because it's a human word. And this, those are things that Ramam said many times. Whereas the other two, uh, with two others necessarily taught some sort of divine science. The fact that it taught science, right? According to Ramam, science in this, in this context means metaphysics, the science of God, is proved by the following dictum, right? It's proved by the following uh, uh, story of Chazal. I'm not at a great stopping point. I don't know if it's okay. I shouldn't go past, past the hour because the next shear starts and a lot of you guys want to go to, to the next class. So, um, uh, I'm going to have to stop kind of in the middle here because we have like two minutes left. I'm going to maybe I'll open the floor for any last minute questions and then we'll close up for the night. I, I do want to tell you, though, that next week he's going to go into what the conversation of God and Moshe was when when God described himself. Eh, yeah, I share. Eh, yeah, I will be as I will be or I am as I am, depending on how you translate it. Ram is going to explain that really, really famous word. And, and, and I'm going to try as hard as I can, like I did tonight, to make it have very current, very real relevant meaning to us. But like, let me give you two minutes to ask questions if you do it so that we can pass on to the next class. Nobody, everybody's like off in the heavens literally now. <laughs> um, if that's the case, then I'm going to close up shop for the night and uh, with God's help, we'll be here next week again together. Well, I have one last question. Oh, please go ahead. For the priestly benediction, because I'm a Kohen, so mm -hmm. uh, I don't see where he, uh, is it clear that it's okay to use the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Aleph, uh, Dalit uh, word uh, in, in the priestly benediction in, in the shul, and now our shul does it on a daily basis? Am I running right. afoul of Maimonides? Uh, no, 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 that's okay. That's what you can use. What you're not supposed to use is the, is the, Right, you in the hay, okay. the, 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 but the Aleph Dalit is is that's what we use as a description of how we experience God. That's what Ramam explains. We say Aleph Dalit Nun Yud because we experience God as a master. I see. It's so I'm, I'm of master. Our, right, it's a description of God's actions. Right. Okay.
to us, he's a master. And that's the closest thing that we can imagine, a slave with a master in, in this context. Sometimes we could experience him as a father, or we can experience him as, as, as a benevolent uh, king or something, right? But, but in, in the, with regards to the priestly benediction, we experience him as a master, right? But, but, um, but that's it. As, yeah, and you have to understand that because the one that really describes his essence, we're not allowed to say. Why? Because it, we're trying to remind ourselves that God's essence is not something that we can ever understand. And that's a crucial, crucial point. And according to Ramam, is really the foundation of what monotheism is all about. The final question is, is, is when, when Christians use the J word, not the right. Jesus, the other one, is that right. because they're trying to mimic the, uh, the, 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 the sounds from just looking at the-, uh, the, the Yeah, if you look at, if you look simply to the, um, to the if you look simply at the, uh, at the, um, at the words in the Hebrew uh, and the way the Nikudot are, right? It looks like uh, that's how you should pronounce it, but it's not. I mean, Ramam explicitly told us that none of us really know how it's properly pronounced. And if we did, we, st we wouldn't be allowed to say it either, of course, but we don't. And no, uh, you know, there's any, anyone, if, and if you've ever read anything about the, the ancient languages, you know, we can try our best to come close to how they were pronounced, but nobody, uh, short of somehow getting into a time machine and running a tape recorder, right, and taping somebody talking 3,000 years ago, there's no way to know exactly how they spoke, right? I mean, it's impossible. And, and, and for a fact, we know for a fact that a dagesh and a hay, which is why the Ramam picked that example, we don't know the difference between a hay with a dagesh or a hay without. We just don't know. So, so, so nobody can claim to know how to pronounce God's name, which has two hays in it, right? We don't know if they're supposed to be a doggish, if they're not supposed to be, and if there is, how you're supposed to pronounce. So anyone that claims to know how to pronounce it is just, is just, you know, they learned a little Hebrew in Olive Bay's reading class, and they opened the sitter, and they, oh, well, I know how to read that. What's the big deal? But no, they don't, right? Anyway, yeah, but that's where it comes from. Thank you. Anything else? Now, uh, the next class I saw is about Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Think about how, what the relevance is if, for those that attend. Anyway, take care and have a wonderful evening. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah.